Welcome to Playing With Fire, the podcast for people who are ready to custom build their love. We're talking about non-monogamy, however you design it, as an individuation opportunity. Want to leave the default and make your life spectacularly you? You're in the right place. Well, hello there. Hi. Hey, so, okay, we're going to talk about compromise today. Um, I know that you didn't want to, but, and I didn't want to. Um, Neither one of us wanted to. couldn't think about a topic. But it seems like a good compromise. So this is where we find ourselves. <laughs> Might be getting a taste for the general tone of this. Okay. It's, it's important to me that we talk about compromise because bef- long before I was a psychologist and long before I was a relationship coach, Um, And long before I was a sex educator, I read a lot of self-help books. (laughs) And a lot of those self-help books for me were about how to fix my tragically imbalanced and disastrous first marriage. And every single one of those books told me I was supposed to compromise. Just without fail, I was told that I was supposed to compromise. I was also told this when I went for premarital counseling before that marriage. Um, I was told about the importance of compromise. And I was told this in not that word, but I was told it over and over again by friends and family who witnessed the dynamic of my first marriage and and saw that we were not um, happy in any particular way. We didn't look happy a lot of the time. I mean, we had our moments. Absolutely. There are some lovely pictures. We clearly did have some moments, but we weren't happy. And people would recommend that we, you know, find a middle ground that we, that we compromise and we find that middle space. And the thing is, I think we were. You think you were compromising? We were compromising. Yeah. We were each compromising, which meant neither one of us was happy. So what, (laughs) what is a compromise? Well, you know, in the framework of these books that I was reading time after time, and and I still turn to some of these books, you know, they're, they're solid choices in many ways. Um, the idea of compromise is that you're going to have differing wants, you're going to have different things that you want, and you're in a relationship. And so you got to find the middle ground. And it's, it's a great idea to think, well, I'll find the 50-50 spot. Mm-hmm. But if you dig into that for even just a moment and you realize that there is, there's a problem, which is that there are some things I don't want to compromise on at a 50, 50 spot, because that means I will actively be acting out of my own interests, like way out of them. Because I may be so far out of line that I'm actually outside of my own ethics, my own values completely, because I've tried to find this middle ground. So let's just say, let's put this into math terms, right? Like, I bet you could write an equation for this, but if you're, I'm going to get the math all wrong. If you're at a hundred and I'm at zero Mm -hmm. and my values are somewhere between zero and 50, right? Like I'm going to be right at the edge of my like ethical and moral values to go meet you at 50. Right. Yeah, I see. I know. I don't think math necessarily worked there, but that's what I felt all the time. Like I was stretching so far. And the thing is, I think he probably thought that too. I, you know, I can't speak for him, but I'm guessing he did. I'm guessing he felt like he was trying and he was trying to meet me halfway. But most of the time, what happened was we were way out beyond what either of us wanted, way past our happiness points and actually pushing against the edge of our own values and not dealing with the reality that we were incredibly different people. Uh, Oh, okay. So there. Um, that's a pretty key point right there. Hey, let's meet halfway. Well, first of all, halfway to where, and what does halfway mean to me versus you? And now we're not the same person. So halfway to what? Halfway to what? And what, what good is halfway to me? Um, you know, well, you were saying, what if, what if 50 is your ethical edge? Well, what if it was 40? Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, so this let's get practical. Okay, yeah, this is let's all the practical. theoretical. I enjoy the math problem. <laughs> um, but okay, for me, compromise stopped being an option 
when I realized that non-monogamy was the right choice for me. When I finally admitted to myself that falling in love with, with people over and over again while happily married was not going to just go away. It was just part of how I am. And I wanted to deal with that. Now, and mind you, I wasn't talking about sex at this point. I was just saying I, I really needed to acknowledge that that was part of my being. Nobody felt that Brian was supposed to meet me halfway then. Interesting. No, where's all that did, compromise talk now? Right. Because in fact, when people were giving me advice about compromise, most of the time, what they meant is, you know, get in the mainstream, like do what people do. And they weren't paying attention to the fact that they had a version of normal that they were measuring each of our wants against. And we each had a version of like, what was right and we would weigh how, like, how far can I stretch into compromise against this idea of normal or right or correct? Huge problem now. Cause once I, once I got out of that mainstream and I was like, okay, I need something different. Ugh. My asking for a compromise was absolutely unacceptable not just to the person I was married to. And he got to set that boundary. Absolutely. And I respect him for setting the boundary. But everybody in my life lost their minds because all of a sudden it wasn't okay for me to have that want, that desire. And so I needed to compromise by going way outside of right. my own ethical values, and, my own sense of self. And so the... Is that even really a compromise? Like, I don't know, I, like compromise as in give up what you want and do this other thing instead. And what other thing? And the thing everybody else is doing. That's, that's the thing that is. makes me. Right. So when I think about, you know, like a, a generic relationship book, I take it off the shelf and it, and they're talking about compromise. The writer has an idea about what, <laughs> what fits into the realm of acceptable too, right? None of us, and including me, none of us is exempt from this. The idea we have this like um, <laughs> realm of okay. Right. And so we certainly believe that the compromise should be in that realm, right? And so <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, compromise, you know, stay within this window of what I think is reasonable. Yeah, um, that has led to some really sketchy stuff happening in well, my life. Well, it, uh, it has led me to behave in some really sketchy ways. Um, I'm guessing this is going to have something to do with me because the yeah, way you just looked at me. <laughs> yeah, so here's a practical example of where compromise appeared and even at times in the moment felt like it was effective and absolutely 100% wasn't. So. Um, the, uh, this is an uncomfortable story for me. Is it too personal? I mean, you don't have it's to not share too story. personal. Uh, I'm actually uh, struggling a little bit to figure out what level of detail to include. The important things are, uh, you were at the hospital with your mother. Okay. It is personal. <laughs> I was back. I mean, it was an hour and a half, almost two hours it's, away, it's a two hour drive. Um, and drive. I was back at home where in the city where we live and you were dealing with, um, major medical issues with your mother. I don't have any problem sharing this. This was, I had to make the decision to withdraw life support. So, and it's not the first time I had done that for a person, but it's the only time I had to do it for my mother. Right. And I had gone out early, early on to be with you and to, um, and to, say to keep you yourself. company, say goodbye myself. And then, um, and that felt right. I, I knew I was in the right place. 
And then, and the thing is, I don't remember exactly how it happened. I don't know if my wife at the time called me or if it was an internal pressure that I felt, but I felt this pressure to go back home because. Uh, oh, it also happened to be Easter. And it was Easter, a so holiday that I have or... actually no particular uh, yeah. feelings or opinions about, but it was a uh, one of the regular holidays around here. And so long story short, I felt this pressure. So I left and I went back to be with my wife and uh, a part of your kids, They're and, the, your biological children. And so, yep. The, and um, that decision felt like a compromise in the moment. It felt like, okay, I've spent a bunch of time with Jolie and it was important. I know it's important and I'm here. And, uh, and now I feel this, this tremendous pressure to go back and spend time with, um, with these other people, like my relationships with them, they, they informed why I wanted to, but it doesn't really matter. I left I compromised. I said, ooh, some time with you and then some time at home with my wife and um, these biological children. It mattered. It did matter a lot. But the thing I'm hearing, I, I'm I'm struck by the other use of the word compromise. You compromised yourself. Ah, you noticed that, did you? I, I just heard yes. it. Yes. Really. Um, the other use of the word compromise. Compromise your values. That's what I did. The, the, you were in dire emotional straits in a, a critical uh, juncture in, in your life. Your, your mother was dying and I left to go spend time with people who were fine, who had no needs. That's the thing. They matter to you. They, they matter, people. but on that day, at that time, they needed nothing from me. Um, but I was trying to discharge some sense of obligation or responsibility, or I, it's the word that's from, then it's coming to mind. It's balance. Well, there was yeah. so compromise and balance went hand in hand for us, right? There was yep. this idea of, um, yeah, compromise being, well, well, if you get this, then I get that. Or let's meet in the middle and split things 50-50. And let's let's find that, let's find halvesies. Yeah. Let's find halvesies. But in in this case, and I, it's okay with me that you're sharing this story. It but but I also know, I know it doesn't make you feel good. I get it. And the memory is fraught for me. But we've also processed it a lot. We have. Because it was a turning point in our relationship. I mean, it was a turning point for me. There's no good time to lose your parents. <laughs> it's just, it sucks. Um, as challenging as my relationship with my mother ever was, um, she was the only person who I really felt was like totally in my corner at that point in my life yeah. because my relationship with you and our other partner was just complicated. And well, it was clearly got some problems because I left <sighs> while your mother was dying. And then while I was gone, she died. So I turned around and, and went back. And mind you, I was alone. Like it <laughs> yeah, wasn't you were that the, I was surrounded all, by like no. a whole other you. bunch of family. I was alone. My my father and my brother were not equipped um to to handle it either, um, unfortunately. And um I mean I got I got a lot out of you coming back to me in that moment. And I got a lot out of being totally 100% present for my mother in those final hours. But when we talk about compromises, it, um... I, I think about how that was a turning point for me because it was the point in our early relationship, because that's a good 18 months in to our serious relationship, where I decided... I was done being gentle about it and trying to make mm -hmm. how much I loved you 
fit into everybody else's ideas of what was okay. Which, which so, had been a compromise. Which had for been me. a compromise, exactly. Like I, I would never hold your hand in public. I was never seen alone with you in in romantic settings. I didn't go out to dinner with you. Like there were things that I had been compromising on because we weren't out. We weren't like publicly out. And that was that moment was when I decided you were going to have to tell me. You were going to have to stand there and say, "Nope, I don't want this." Because up till then, I had been compromising with unspoken, yes. implicit mm-hmm. desires, wants, and needs. Yeah, They were not things that you had said, it has to be exactly like this. I didn't actually know you were going to leave the hospital. I didn't know. Why, Why would you? Yeah. And there were a million other things I could point to in those early days. And I'm, th- I'm guessing you could point to those same things. We didn't have the conversations that would have led us authentically show up and say, even if this isn't fair in a 50, 50 sense, this is what I need right now. Could, could we figure out how I could get this need met? That is a really great sounding little conversation, very straightforward, very clear, and would have addressed a lot of, a lot of what looking back, um, I I don't I don't know what the right word was, but it was dumb. Like those, the time that I left <laughs> well, the hospital and drove away. And here's the thing: I I left the hospital, and then came back, uh, max sixteen hours. Yeah, it, it, was, was, a, it was just about that stupidest sixteen hours of my life. Why? To what end? And and a and a short conversation a short straightforward conversation between us where i said so what do you need right now and you know from me and and how can i um how can i support you right now and then you telling me and me deciding then in the so here's what i can do here's what i think i can do and here and and maybe it could even go a level deeper and say and here's why i think that i might have to leave here at some point and then we could have had a conversation about why I felt that way. And then it would have been a whole other conversation. But the starting point was clarity of you expressing and a- expressing what you wanted and asking me what was going to work for me. Right. And so not a compromise. But so both of us there it. struggled deeply mm-hmm. because we had been we had been practicing trying not to impose too much on each other. Yeah. Uh, quite a lot. Yeah. And, but mm. even now I find us, sometimes we practice imposing too much on each other and presuming we do know what the other person wants and needs, like reading each other's minds, right? True. Yeah. Both of these modes lead us out of authentic ownership of what we actually want. It also leads us out of the, um, the I thou relationship. I think I know what you want. Well, that's an interesting standpoint, but now ask. Now check in, because I'm not you. Okay, so super important. The I-thou relationship. So you're talking about like Martin Buber's use of I-thou. In mm-hmm. other words, sacred otherness. Yeah. If if I recognize my own um, fully <laughs> empowered if I can recognize my own fully empowered self, capital S self, and I can relate to you as fully other Mm -hmm. and hold that, hold the tension of the fact that that means that there will necessarily be a gap. And in that gap, maybe so much unspoken nonsense. (laughs) That's a good way to describe it. Or a deep honoring of this is the space where we can share and say the stuff that we need without guarantee that those needs will all be met by this person in this specific way. And so now we get into sorting out what is my need? For instance, if my need in that moment was to be supported, you might have said, okay, you know what? I'm not the only person who could support you. Who else could be of support to you? And you might've brainstormed and thought Mm -hmm. about it. And at that juncture in my life, 
the list had gotten pretty winnowed. Um, I had lost a lot of friends during my divorce. Um, and obviously my mother was gone and it didn't leave a ton of options, but I don't know that it left none. Well, and whether I, we never even, we never it. even considered it, it would have been, a, it yeah, it would have been a clarifying conversation. And if we had had it, it might have, um, put into perspective, oh, um, there isn't anybody else. So I don't think it's reasonable for me to go after all. Maybe that's where I would have gotten to, Maybe. but it would have been at the end of a conversation. And so building and on, you know, some something I talk about all the time, the difference between needs and wants and desires, a need is high, in my book, high level, and it can be met in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. A need, it's core, it's central, it's important. Um, but the want is, and then I want it to be acted on. I want my need to be delivered in this specific way. And a want is negotiable. A want is where we meet in the middle in that gap between I, thou. We meet in that space and we figure out, okay, and given the context we find ourselves in, and that means all the context, the, the microcosm of us, but then the larger scope of our family and our friends and our world and our society and all of that. What are the options available to us? How might we creatively meet this need? And that's the thing. For me, wants, they're usually pretty narrow, but that's just because I'm in here. And in here, it's hard to have a fully open imagination to all the multiple ways my needs might be met. Okay. And so mm -hmm. in the, if I bring my need out into the space between us, and I do that in a, with really in good faith and say, would you help me? Could we, could we spend some time and energy considering the many ways that this need might be met? And, and that might require taking pauses, taking, taking breaks. It, it might require, you know, some, some really some active letting go of this idea I have of exactly what my want is, how I want that need to be met. I might have to really do some nervous system regulation. I might need to get a snack. Yeah, snack. <laughs> I might need to sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's absolutely. I, yeah. absolutely. I mean, this is one of the reasons why it was so hard to come to compromise on that incredibly fraught situation that you were describing we couldn't take a break. Yep. We couldn't even get food. They were like, oh, we were, that's right. we were kind of, yeah. it was really rough. It was a Saturday night on Easter weekend in a major metropolitan hospital. Um, but it's still Easter weekend and everything was just closed all around. It was terrifying because it was so lonely. Yeah. And that started constraining my imagination. I really couldn't imagine anything other than like breath to breath. I wasn't even living minute to minute, I was living breath to breath. And so my imagination was foreclosed. All I could feel was this need I had to not be alone. And it actually got so big that I couldn't communicate it to you fully. Yeah. I Let see. alone there being any way for me to enter into the problem solving. Also the fact that we didn't have the experience or tools to have those kinds of conversations. Right. I didn't have any, I, I had push-ups. Oh, you had I had push-ups. Push you had push-ups, um, but they weren't very effective at the time. I used a lot. I, I did a lot of push-ups, mm -hmm. um, trying to burn off the, the the frazzled energy. But you know, we have so many hundreds of small situations happen every month where there's this option for me or for you to be in that need space. Like I have a need, and almost always attached to a need, I find my want. I find like, oh. yep, I have need. And this is how mm -hmm. I want you to meet that need. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or this is how I want oh, yeah. anyone, whoever it is. Yep. Um, I have a I have a an itch on my back and I want that to be met in a very specific way. Right. I want you to scratch my back and I want you to do it just this way. And oh, not over the shirt. I want you to go under the shirt. And I want you to like, would you move my bra strap and would you and, and then use your nail just a certain way? Like I want it to be so specific but you might get the dry brush out and dry brush my back. And that could also feel great. Or I could go find my back scratch. Like what a simple tight, like that's an interesting example of that. Somebody dying. I have an itchy I back. Have an itchy back. <laughs> and I would like you to help soothe that. Most of the time with most of our needs, um, we've made the bandwidth 
So that compromise is really, it's the last thing on my mind. I'm thinking about creatively solving for right. the needs and wants. Well, and here's a picture that has been building in my mind as you've been talking. So we talked about the I thou relationship and the distance between us, that space yeah. that is a that is a place that uh, either one of us can say, I have a need here mm -hmm. um, or I have a want. Um, would you help me uh, get it? And having the explicit conversation, wonderful. Okay. If instead um, I find that you have a competing, like we're, we haven't even gotten into asking for the, 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 the help or the, the participation, but we both have a need, a want, whatever it is. And we say, okay, I'll meet you halfway. Halfway is no more space. We've moved toward oh. each other. And all of a sudden we're enmeshed which is a thing as, you know, in working on an individual individuating relationship, it's not what we want. It's not what we set out to do. So if we move in and we use up all that space. That's, a, that is a fascinating aspect of this because the other, the other thing that I write about when I write about compromise is that if, when we get too close together, in every single, like over and over and over again, we always meet 50, 50. We don't get the psychological differentiation right. that we want. We don't yeah. get to see that truly some of our needs may be incompatible. They, oh yes. Some of our needs may be, mm. they, they, they literally cannot be met inside this container. And this yep. is part of why we're not monogamous. <laughs> That's right. It's not because other people need to fill those needs even. It's because I want to go seek my own responses to those right. needs and they're your needs i'm not responsible for them yeah Just i like may you're not be willing to participate pleasure. but i am not responsible for it yeah which is a kind of an uncomfortable thing to say an uncomfortable standpoint to take when i've been raised in this monogamous culture that oh no of course it is and if it isn't Oh, what is keeping us connected? Oh no, you will go away because I'm not meeting all your needs that you haven't asked me to meet. <laughs> okay. uh, anyway. Well, this is where though the principles of, of our non-monogamy really are about staying present to our growth. Yes. Even when it's uncomfortable. Even when it's uncomfortable. Because enmeshment for us, and, and so meeting 50-50 meeting halfway and finding a spot where we can both agree that it's fine. <laughs> that we're both, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. That's how he knows when there's trouble. It's fine. Yeah. Um, not when we're fighting, just in bed. No. Nope. If it's so, fine, that's no good. Oh, so fine. how was that? It was fine. Uh oh. <laughs> right. Because fine is not good enough. Because that's not what we're going it's for. That's not what we're going for. Right. We're going for more than fine. And in that space of having compromised in a way that leaves us with no breathing room, mm. I just find a lack of creativity. I just oh, I feel my it, own mm -hmm. lack of creativity. I'm like, okay, this was good enough. Oh, it reminds me of when, um, when I make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for a kid because they didn't want to eat the meal. Like, it's fine. The compromise is they got some food in them, but it's just a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's not like, it's not a, a it's not a well-balanced meal for them to eat day after day after day. Right. It's mediocre at best. And so I don't feel good about it. And it's yeah. okay on any given day for any given problem. That's fine. It's the peanut butter and jelly sandwich of the world. That's okay. But if that's most of our relationship, I don't. I that, don't want the PB and J relationship. No, I don't, I don't want, want that. the PB and J sex. <laughs> no, I don't want that. So like that, it's, it's okay. It, it'll do. It'll do. Yeah. We'll get out here. This, this will be good enough. So instead though, we have to, to tolerate um, those moments of, of being so different. We have to tolerate being different mm -hmm. and staying present to what it takes to be in that creative space, because on the other hand, <laughs> you're not not responsible for 
being with me and helping me get my needs met. Like that's why we're doing this at all. That's why we're doing this. And my, so the flip side, like, I don't, I don't, I have no intention of being in relationship with anyone who's like, yeah, you're on your own. I mean, what, why, why bother? You have a flat tire. Hey, good luck with that. Right. Uh, yeah. So we're, so we're here participating in this relationship, both working on being the most self self we can be yep. while also interacting with each other and caring about and for each other, yep. which requires a lot of investigation, continual investigation. So uh, we were talking about relationship agreements yeah. tonight earlier, and it's, it's very, very important, but you better be ready to do it again later because it's not going to stay the same. Right. So even if you compromise, even if you compromise, if one person's needs, wants, or desires shift just a little bit, you know, they're alive because life, we have to renegotiate. And so this is actually one of, I think I would add, I would put this on my, um, uh, troubleshooting list when it comes to compromise or when it comes to relationship agreements, maybe one way I watch clients get what they want without ever having to really ask for it is to stay in that compromise space. Like, okay, we're going to meet halfway. So we meet halfway, we meet halfway, we meet halfway. Okay. Some time goes by. Now I, now I'm, I change my needs. I shift. I ask for something new and I ask you to meet me halfway again. Oh, and now I shift again, six months later. And I ask you to meet me halfway again. Sometimes that's a manipulative strategy because doing that, you can get all the way to what you originally wanted because you've shifted it. And, and I see people do this mm. when they're afraid to ask for what they actually want. So I don't mean like, yep. it is okay to take a titrated graduated risk approach to, okay, let's say I would like to be completely sexually autonomous. I'm going to go have sex with whoever I want and I'm going to leave behind our monogamous commitment and do that. And you're like, whoa, that's, I'm not ready for that. Um, it's okay to take years even maybe, to maybe from... you could like go out to dinner with somebody and i could see how i feel about that and we could deal with it little bits at a time right sure totally right that's a, so i'm not a talking way. about that of course it's okay to take that graduated risk entry experiment figure out how this all works but what i see happen is people will show up with needs that they'll tell me about or they know what they want but they only ask for what they think they can get. They get their partner to meet them out there and they, they never really voice their true desires. And now I'm realizing I'm describing your entry into our relationship. Yeah, I, I wondered when you were going to get there. I was trying to think of a good example I could say. So you might be talking about one of the many Such times that I have done that exact ass. thing um, because I was I was absolutely in, unwilling, incapable, I don't know, of saying... I want this. I was incapable of making a decision for sure. And so the result was because I didn't know myself well enough to say, I want this. And I didn't have the strength of character enough to say, and I would like this with you. Would you do this with me? Yeah. Um, as a result, it was a lot of manipulative behaviors that, um, are exactly what you've been describing. Well, this is why, yeah. And and I, I really, I promise I was not meaning to call no, you No, no, I, I was watching it happen. I'm like, oh, that's me. But yeah. I, I see it happen and it is unintentional coercion. Because I didn't mean to coerce you. Yep. I mean, in retrospect, I can see how it was a choice between saying, would you do this and, um, and risking failure right. and moving into what I was, pretty sure you were going to say yes to, and then moving from there. It was just about staying safe, like maintaining the feeling of safety. Right. But, um, but that's, that is the opposite of the discomfort that we talk about you people having to experience 
to so this is really be your own self. This is really normal. So mm-hmm. people engage, we all engage in cognitive distortions all the time. And and one of the common things we do is we we mind read. We imagine that we know what our partner's answer will be. So I'm preparing to ask my partner for something. I know I have a need. I've identified it. Yay. Celebrate the hell out Good of that. Stuff there. Great. Um, I have imagined a want, a way that I want this need to be enacted. And now I'm going to ask you for it. But I think I already know your answer. So I engage in the mind reading fallacy. I imagine I know your answer. And so now I ask for something else. I dial that that want back and I ask for something else. And I rob both of us of being able to have the real conversation that we want to have. Yeah. The yep. real conversation that we actually showed up to this marriage to have, which is complicated and messy and yes, might result in hurt feelings. And that's why we engage in skills like embodied skills, like neurosomatic intelligence, but also skills of, well, how can we speak to each other when we're hurt? How do we come back together? How do we, how do we make restitution to what each other? What are the moves in those? What are our situations? moves? And there are, yeah. are so many of them. I'm really grateful that we both decided not to compromise ourselves. So am I. Yes. But we only did it after, after uh, fucking around and finding out for a Ooh. long time. That's true. And I noticed that when I start new relationships, I try really hard to get to the spot where, where neither of us is compromising because we're fully out there and we're, we're like, here, I'm going to lay my cards on the table and I'm going to ask you for what I want and need. And I'm, and I invite you to set boundaries. But what I notice is as I start new relationships, a lot of people are really uncomfortable with how clear I am about my boundaries and accepting theirs. That I'm not asking them to compromise and to, to compromise themselves actually makes them a little uncomfortable. And so I just think this is a place where I see my clients struggle with it. We struggled with it so much. And I, I watch, you know, in my own dating life, I watch this happen. Boldness, boldness, courage, courage, my friends, this is not out of reach. And boldness and courage and something, um, in this, in this, um, in this scenario where um, you, instead of backing off, you say, this is what I want. You may even imagine what my response is going to be, but you boldness and courage and you say, I'm going to ask anyway, here it is. Yeah. I mean, you do that all the time. It's actually me who should be in this, in, in that side, in this scenario. I want this. Okay. And I'm going to risk the experience of your, rejection or just you're saying well let's talk about it well that does feel like rejection let's and it does clear, even just even even just be getting a let's talk about it feels like rejection yeah. and if you have rejection sensitivity disorder right this you know this probably doubles down for you and here's uh here's my experience of this is if i capitulate to that compromise position it's actually complete self-deception. I'm trying to avoid something that I think is real. I think you're going to say no. So then rather than finding out and facing the reality, I do something else that allows me to pretend that, well, maybe she would have said yes. Maybe I could have that. So rather than face a reality that I think is true, or I would have asked for it in the first place, I do an end run around it. Can you give me an example? Ooh, let's see. So even um, if it's not real. Yeah, let me see. So um um, I see. I mean, it could be anything. It could be um, uh, you know, I am just I'm so tired of cooking. I don't want to cook another meal. I want to go out to dinner, but I'm pretty sure that you're not feeling that way. And so I think you're not going to want to go to dinner. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't have clear examples of this, but I'm going to do a couple things to try to like 
not try, and this isn't conscious, but I, I do these things that sort of guide you in the direction of going to dinner instead of cooking at home. Okay, what's the end game here? We go out to dinner, you're unhappy. And I knew it right from the beginning. But I have to fool myself. There's a lot of deception in there. Yeah. I, You have such a different experience of this than I do because your way of getting things is it's, it's it, much more indirect folks. right it is so it yeah. falls more into the realm of um subtle subversive coercion whereas i'm much yes. more likely to be actively um pressuring yep. and and lean into bullying right like if, if we were to go to extremes i would say you're passive aggressive and i'm aggressive aggressive yeah we play so we chess have... you'll be constantly putting me in check <laughs> right. But never winning because you have some great skills. That I just... have some subtlety yep. about sneaking around the edges. Right. So these are just different ways yep. that, that the problems of compromise can feel inside each of us. We have, we... <laughs> there, there isn't just one way that, that compromise can go badly or can interfere with your actual authentic relating to the partners that you have. And that's what I meant about the self-deception. If I'm trying to have a uh, an actually healthy relationship where we're both working toward our, you know, our self-expression self and our, so uh, I'm in the middle, you know, in, in this dinner scenario, I'm in the middle of trying to get you to do something I know you don't want to do. Yeah, that's not cool. No, that's not cool. But, and if we make that, and, and if I all can, of a sudden that isn't dinner, but is sex. Ooh, <laughs> oh my. That just got real now messy. Now this real got fast. real messy. And you could slap the label of compromise over all of that. I think I, I could. I could say, well, we'll compromise because one, one compromise could be, well, let's go to dinner tonight and tomorrow we'll cook a meal. The result is not happiness. It is not authentic relating. Um, and I'm guessing it's not going to go very well either that night or the next day. Right. So what's what's striking me is how not owning the actual want mm -hmm. creates the opportunity for a lot of deception. That's where the self-deception starts. adds right up there. so fast mm -hmm. when we're talking about So we take this out of the realm of dinner. We take it yeah. into the realm of things like sex, things like where we spend our money um, in the big picture, things like how we raise our children. And all of a sudden, yep. these things add up really, really quickly. And on both sides of the equation, the bottom line is we just don't actually get to fully be ourselves. Right. Um, I'm grateful that we can have these conversations now and talk about even like the worst times yeah. where this has gone really badly and know that no matter how badly you and I have done these things in the past, we've proved to ourselves that we can learn our way out of them. Yeah, and, that, that is true. Because, But the, it's not book learning. Like, I mean, no. I learned some of this stuff literally out of books and papers. But then we had to put it into a then we had to go experiential experiment. practice. Yeah. And we're always experimenting now. And that's how we make this work. We just keep learning how it actually looks in real life. Yep. And the reason that I, I brought up the self-deception is because of the incredible number of times that I will reflect and be like, oh no, I did it again. I just completely fooled myself. Into thinking. Into that thinking were... that I was relating when what I was doing was trying to manipulate you into giving me what I wanted. I do it a lot and have done it. I mean, the first years of our relationship was all of that. Because you didn't think you actually got to ask for because, anything. Yeah. And but, which meant I thought that I didn't get to be me. But yeah. we all do get to be us. Yeah. And I, I'm, I do. I'm I want to go back and take <laughs> that guy and just like slap him across the face so many times and then say, and also, it's okay to be you. Yeah. Your wants. It would are be my better. Favorite to be you. part about you. They are. I and everyone I have ever dated, my favorite part is getting to know what they want. It's a lot and of And if fun. I don't want to be the person to provide that want, that's okay. Like 
it, that doesn't stop me from enjoying the exploration. So we got to believe in each other a little bit more. Yes. And I'm glad we can have this conversation and have it be okay because yeah, that's hella messy stuff. <laughs> oh, it really is. It is. So thanks. Thank you. Thank and you. everybody out there, don't compromise. No, be you. Can you can do better than that. <laughs> um, okay. This particular podcast episode is blowing my mind because these are the skills that let you transform your relationship. Yes. And if transforming your relationship, if reimagining love is your priority right now, I have the perfect opportunity for you to join me. I invite you to come to my next live training um, event. Um, I have a virtual salon that will help you figure out whether you can put the five pillars of opening successfully into your relationship. Opening can mean a lot of things. So take a deep breath. Think about it. Show up for the next salon. These events absolutely help people figure out how to do this well. And so you can go to joliehamilton.com, go to the free live training and You'll sign see up. See a registration link right there. And in the meantime, take good care of yourselves. Listen to your inner voice and go be messy.